I prepared a presentation, and I'm actually just going to skip it. I think I'm more comfortable just speaking off the cuff. And what I'm going to be discussing today is whether or not this debate about 12-step versus non-12-step self-help involvement and treatment is relevant in a conversation about treatment today. And what I'd like to add to the conversation is rather than being discussing whether or not it's 12-step or not 12-step based, identifying what really are probably the two more relevant styles of treatment, which really aren't even part of that conversation. And that's going to be what I will call uh, more, the more curative approaches and a, what I'll call an ASAM-inspired approach. It's uh, the best name I could come up with for it. And really what we're going to be talking about is whether or not a, the, a, a treatment is inspired by a view of addiction as a um, chronic and primary disorder or whether or not it's seen as an acute secondary disorder. Because really, these two different mindsets are really what's going to be shaping treatment, not whether or not they're 12-step based or not. Um, so let me define some of the words that I just mentioned, acute. I'll, I'll start with acute um, versus chronic. An acute condition is one that is time limited, that, that, um, that it's either going to resolve itself or that with some sort of treatment that it could be resolved fully and there would be no, no concern of it again. Um, some, some examples might be a cold, a common cold or a flu or perhaps a broken leg. And, the, and in the case of the broken leg, it's not like it's just going to go away on its own. It's going to require some sort of treatment, but that with that treatment, the, the, the leg is no longer a concern. With a chronic condition, some examples might be asthma, hypertension, diabetes. With, with these sorts of uh, disorders, almost always, uh, they're with the individual on an, in an ongoing way, and whether or not they're, they're um, causing any significant impact is going to be uh, dictated by whether or not they're being managed or not. Now, primary versus secondary disorders. A primary, well, let's start with secondary. A secondary disorder is one that um, may or may not have been, well, it's, it's a symptom of something else, basically. So, a secondary disorder um, manifests because of something else. And if you resolve the other issue, the primary, if you will, then the secondary issue goes away by itself as, as a result of, of managing the primary concern. A primary disorder is going to be one that probably is its own entity, but it could also be partly or even wholly caused by something else. But it ultimately is its own thing and can't be resolved by fixing something else. So if you fix something else, you're still going to have the primary disorder. And it's this difference between um, seeing addictive disorders as being acute secondary disorders versus chronic primary disorders. It really shapes the style of treatment. Let's take a look at uh, acute um, secondary disorder way of looking at addiction. And I'm kind of call that kind of curative because generally the mindset is, is that you're going to resolve the, the substance use behavior by dealing with the primary. And some examples of this is seeing uh, a substance use behavior as being caused by a mental health condition and that when you resolve the underlying issue, so to speak, then the, then the uh, substance use disorder is going to resolve itself. Another one might be a vitamin deficiency uh, there's 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 uh, some folks working with sugar. That, you know that that uh, uh, substance use out of control substance use behavior is caused by imbalances with sugar. And so if you resolve the sugar issue, then then the addictive disorder will go away. Uh, trauma. Some people suggest that all all uh, substance use uh, disorders are caused by trauma. If you resolve the trauma, then then that that'll take care of the problem. And there's there's just many 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 more. Um, I guess a couple more examples I'll list would be uh, it's a um, learned behavior that can be unlearned. So, so once you unlearn it, then you know, the primary problem is that it's a learned or hip habituated issue. So if you unhabituate or unlearn it, then the problem is resolved. And in, and in all of these types or approaches to addiction treatment, uh, self-help groups 
are going to play little or, or not have much relevance because they're curative in nature and that um, the substance use behavior is just a, a symptom of kind of the real problem and focus, focus is on, then on the real problem rather than the substance use disorder. As far as a, um, the other type, types of treatment, which I'm going to call um, the chronic and progressive treatments, and, and I said ASAM inspired, it, it doesn't need to be. There doesn't even have to be familiarity or involvement with ASAM, which, which is the American Society of Addiction Medicine. I just mentioned them because they probably have the most robust definition of addiction that, that I'm, a, I'm familiar with. And there's others, the World Health Organization has their own, but it still hasn't really changed since 1964. And they'll refer to the ICD-10, which doesn't just define or define addiction, it just more lists a series of things to be able to identify it, which is a lot different than defining it. The, the um, uh, DSM in the United States is very much the same thing. So we're left with uh, maybe NIDA and SAMHSA, who, who of course have their own definitions. Uh, which are which are science based, but a lot of times those are um, not not viewed with full trust because they're governmental agencies. And and one of the nice things about uh, for me, I like about uh, a definition put forth by uh, the American Society of Addiction Medicine is it's roughly three thousand individuals coming from multiple dif different disciplines. It's not only coming from psychology or just from neurobiology or you know. There's, there's multiple disciplines that have to bring forth peer-reviewed information, peer-reviewed studies that are based on other peer-reviewed studies um, and kind of vetted by professionals from a multidisciplinary team. And that's how they're going to arrive at their, at their definition versus sometimes what we'll find is um, addiction being defined by uh, a single study that was highly controlled and then generalized to the population without really kind of, you know, working with that a little bit more before, before doing that. And um, their definition that the ASAM puts forward is a couple of pages long, which helps us see that this is a very complex disorder uh, with varying etiology. In other words, there isn't like the singular cause that there's, you know, it's based in reward, but that uh, there's many pathways to addiction just as there is to recovery and that there's various different presentations. But ultimately, they define it as a chronic, progressive, and um, primary disorder uh, that's based in brain reward, memory, motivation, circuitry. And that's kind of um, the current model for primary and, and chronic. And so treatment that, in, that is focusing on addiction as a primary and chronic disorder <coughs> should not be having what self-help group involvement is going to be taking place as a primary focus of treatment. In modern treatment, more appropriate focuses might be um, whether or not pharmacotherapy is going to be included and you know, certainly an assessment and inclusion were necessary. Assessment of uh, the home life or support systems and then having that be addressed if necessary. Teaching skills to manage uh, negative emotional states as well as how are you going to deal with positive emotional states which can also be problematic. Uh, uh, addressing any co-occurring disorders and including that uh, those need to be included in one's long-term sobriety plan. Relapse prevention, family involvement, uh, motivation enhancement, and then also dealing with the existential crisis that comes about with a diagnosis of any chronic condition, like the ones I mentioned, maybe hypertension or diabetes or addiction, that this is going to change things. You're, you're not going to be living the same lifestyle if, you know, if, you're, if your idea of fun has always been to hang out at a keg party seven days a week, then that's going to have to change, and it changes, you know, who are you? The identity changes as well. And this needs to be a primary focus of modern treatment, helping people kind of redefine themselves in ways that are adaptive as an individual with a substance use disorder. What self-help group is, in, is being included is not super relevant, um, just that there is one. 
or more. Self-help groups are not treatment unless they're self-administered. I mean, it is treatment if you just go to one of Life Ring or AA or any of the other. If you go there, use it to get sober and maintain your sobriety, then I would argue that it's self-administered treatment. But that doesn't work for a lot of people, and that's why treatment exists. Treatment exists to be able to assess things that are outside of the domain of any of the self-help groups, like the list that I, that I mentioned earlier. Today, uh, in modern treatment, a lot of times what happens is we're 12-step based or we're not 12-step based. And what this does is it limits the clients down to one option. And it also requires that they know what's best for them before entering treatment, which is ludicrous. For an individual entering treatment, this is not the highlight of their, of their life. This is not the point where they're at their best decision-making capacity. <laughs> They're usually detoxing. Every single decision that they make about even who they are and what they do is based in trying to make sense out of their substance use behaviors. And uh, they're in crisis. Nobody enters treatment not in crisis. This is not a time to be having kind of, you know, how is this thing going to end figured out, but maybe how is it going to be beginning. And treatment choice is incredibly important. Clients should know that they don't have to figure that out before entering treatment, that that can be part of the treatment. What 12-step or not 12-step involvement or what kind of self-help groups that they're going to be utilizing to manage the ongoing chronic nature of the condition is part of a treatment process. It's part of an individual choice. It's part of a decision. Or whether or not to even do that is part of their choice. It shouldn't be decided already that they're going to be doing any of it, and if so, the client themselves needs to have the final say and, and full choice in that. I think it's important that they, that they at least know that they don't have to decide ahead of time, that there should not be a debate about 12-step versus non-12-step in, in modern treatment, at least not in the context of treatments that are based in uh, a definition of addiction that is chronic and primary. In the curative-based approach, then, well, they're all non-false stuff, but they're all probably not any of it when it boils right down to it. And, and the focus isn't even going to be on the substance use disorder. It's going to be focusing on something uh, else with the, with the belief that that's going to resolve the substance use disorder. I am part of an organization that in 2012 was a 12-step, strictly 12-step based. Um, and we... We made a decision, we sat down and we were, we were talking about life ring and some other things, we made a decision to not limit our clients to, to, to just one way of looking at things. We, we redesigned the program a little bit and, and we make sure that people know that they have choices, they're introduced to different concepts, different ways of doing things. And what I find is a lot of people choose the 12 steps because it's perfect for them and it works and a lot of people choose non-12 steps. And interestingly, a lot of people choose both, which drives some people crazy, but why not? You know, it's, you know you get your needs met in different places because you got different needs, and, and that's working for a lot of people as well. And, and I don't find that there's different levels of efficacy or outcome for any of these. What I find is the same thing that study after study has shown, the reason that insurance companies require three meeting uh, attendance per week as part of treatment in order to pay is that people who leave treatment engaged in some sort of self-help uh, community or process do significantly better than those who are not engaged in anything when they leave treatment. What they're involved in doesn't seem to matter as long as they picked it. That's the only thing that matters. Today, if you look around, you're in a room filled with people who were given the choice of 12-step versus non-12-step. They at least cho chose partially non-12-step and are thriving today. And that's the reality. And I thank you for letting me deliver this today. The definition of addiction that I prefer or yes. just the different ones? I, I like... 
I like American Society of Addiction Medicine's definition because it's a lot of, it's a multidisciplinary evidence-based definition and that they define it as a primary, chronic, pro progressive, based in reward, memory, motivation, and related circuitry. ASAM, A-S-A-M. Yes. So the question is going to, it was basically, we were talking about 12-step versus non-12-step and, and treatment and kind of, kind of viewing that different. And the, and the question was, how do we get the, the self-help groups themselves to stop having polarizing language? And, and my answer is good luck, first off. <laughs> um, and, and I, which could be a whole nother talk and, and arguably should be at some point. Uh, these, these programs are essentially cultures. There's a culture to all of these different groups, and, and, and culture is what binds people together, and it's highly effective at mobilizing people to support each other in a cause. That's, that's how cultures come together, is, to, is for survival, and, and self-help groups really utilize that, that kind of same philosophy. And one thing about cultures is, we're the best one, is pretty typical, and, and our way is the right way, which, which reinforces whatever it is that you're doing within the culture. So it, as problematic as it is, it's also somewhat, somewhat helpful, too. It's just, it'd be nice if it didn't have to include that, but that's, that is how human beings work. Yes? Um, I think that there overall is consensus within the psychological and medical community. There, there definitely is, but there's also always outliers in anything. Um, you can find people that will say that um, um, John Kennedy was killed by space lizards from Pluto. I mean, so, and, and who knows? Maybe. I, I don't know. Um, so, so there's always room for different opinions. There's always different room for different voices. And uh, there's going to be different, different ideas about how to treat addiction. Yeah. Main, mainstream modern psychology and medicine will work from a primary chronic perspective. Mm -hmm. And, I would, I, and I, I'm going to make the argument, and this is my opinion, the vast majority or preponderance of evidence really kind of supports that versus uh, acute and secondary. But other people have different opinions than that. It's a lot, to, let, let, me, let me paraphrase that. Um, it seems that even somebody who has a co-occurring disorder, um, who has a substance use disorder, curing the, the, the secondary, the mental health disorder doesn't necessarily seem like it takes away the mental health disorder, I mean the, the substance use disorder. If that person was to talk themselves into using the future, it's probably not gonna go well which would be evidence more of a substance use disorder than, than the, 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 the primary. I understand that, and in and, and most modern treatment today, they're seen as separate but interrelated. You can't manage a mental health disorder if you have a substance use disorder active. It doesn't work, not very well anyway. If you don't manage your, second, your mental health disorder, you're pro probably not going to be able to manage your addictive disorder either. So, so usually in modern treatment, they're, they're identified, recognized, and seen as part of a continuum of care that needs to include, include all of these aspects. And that's, that's where treatment can come into play and identify and help people I develop um, pathways to ongoing sobriety that might not be recognized or addressed in just self-help group, groups alone. The question really was, was how, many, how, many, how much of the treatment community views what I just said, and, and of course I said not, not enough. And, um, and the, the, the second statement was that there is oftentimes hostility towards non-12 step-based approaches, and that's true. And that's, that's what I'm here to talk about today. This really needs to change. This is 2016. We understand a lot more about addictive disorders. There is choices today. There's not only one game in town. Most cities have multiple self-help approaches available, and it is the responsibility of treatment providers to make sure that the clients have choice. That's what individual, you know, we claim that we do individualized treatment as professionals. Well, individualized treatment means helping clients find what's best for them. It may be 12 steps, it may not be 12 steps, but uh, and to, to, like, once again, I like to say, make, having somebody make that choice when they're in crisis and stoned is, is ludicrous. Like, let them, let them kind of stabilize first and, 
you know, allow that, that choice to be part of the journey. And my hope is that we can move towards that. Is there statistics for 12-step versus non-12-step? I don't think that there's really any good ones. You get a lot of you get a lot of claims, but they're based in inconsistent comparison. Um, I, I haven't seen anything that was um, cogent and well put together. But but my experience is, whatever somebody picks will work. That's just because of anonymity on the list, right? It's partly because of that, and it's also partly because, like we talked about earlier, is that there's this adversarial view and there's a big push back from the non-12-step community and other people against the 12-step community to try to debunk it, which alienates people instead of here's what we have to offer, which it would probably change that a lot. It's unfortunate that that's what's going on today, but we need change, but it, it needs to be based in science, rational arguments, not inconsistent comparison, uh, not making claims that, that really aren't well substantiated, and that there's room for everything. So, so you'll hear language like that, and, and, and there's, there's other approaches, there's other opinions even within that community. So if that, if some people will just work through that, and some people need to go someplace else. They go to life room. You're not going to hear that statement in life room. <laughs> and if you do, then a convener's job is to fix that problem. So. Great, so we have a speaker today to answer that question. Thank you very much.